Today, we're talking all about baseline data, giving you the best ways to take baseline data and how to use it effectively. Very often, we are collecting data and we're collecting data on behavior reduction goals. And sometimes the staff will come to me and say, it's not working. The child is still having this challenging behavior. It's still so hard to manage and I don't feel like it's working. So my suggestion is always let's check the data and specifically check the baseline because when we're collecting baseline data on behavior, then comparing it to post-treatment, you can get a really good picture of whether or not that treatment is working. So even though it still feels hard and the behavior might still be happening, when you go back and reference the baseline data, it can really tell you whether or not that intervention is working. Do you ever get anybody looking at you like a deer in headlights going, uh, baseline, what's baseline? So baseline data can refer to information both on skill acquisition and behavior reduction. So we take we collect data on lots of things and those are probably the two main areas. We want to increase skills that we want to see more of, which we call skill acquisition, and we want to decrease behaviors that we want to see less of. And so we call those behavior reduction. So there's generally two camps of data collection of things we want to see increasing and things that we want to see decreasing. Let's talk about behavior reduction first, and then maybe we talk about skill acquisition second so that we're not muddling the two of them. Right. So when we want to see behaviors changing and specifically reducing over time, if it's something that's very challenging, we have to have something to compare it to because without data, we're just collecting people's opinions. So sometimes, especially if you're the parent or the caregiver or the teacher, the one dealing with the behavior, it feels really hard. It doesn't feel like it's getting better. It doesn't feel like the behavior is happening less. And the only way for us to know is if we have something to compare it to. So the first thing that we do when looking at behavior reduction goals is before even putting any treatment in place is my first go-to is collect data. So if I anticipate a problem is just starting to develop or a teacher or a staff member come to me and say, you know, this student is having this challenging behavior. Before I give them any suggestions, I'll say, collect data. Take a couple days, you know, three to five days of just good baseline data. How often is the behavior happening? What are the antecedents? Is it specific to a time of day? Just get information. When we collect that information before any intervention or before any strategies are recommended, we call that baseline data. I love what you said that, and I need to frame that, you know, without data, it's just someone's opinion Um, because I've gone into classrooms, I've gone into ABA programs and so many times people have said, well, you know, the behavior seems really, really high. You go, okay, well, let's take some data on that. No, 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 no. I know that it's high and uh, I think this is going to work. Let's try it. No, 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 no. Hold on. Let's back up a second. Um, And oftentimes I'll get complaints about, well, if we baseline data and we take a while to baseline, then we're not putting a treatment in place. So, but we need a treatment. I need you to wave your magic wand and I need a treatment in place ASAP. You're a behavior analyst, you know, help me out with this. Um, And sure, I like what you said about that gathering information, right? We really do need to gather information so that it can be an effective treatment. And, you know, I'll go back and make the analogy with people about, you know, either you're helping out and really decreasing the source of the negative behavior, or you're putting a Band-Aid on it. And if you really want to go to the source and really, you know, decrease that negative behavior from the source, meaning I'm treating the function of the behavior. And I'm also teaching skill acquisition so that that behavior um, can reduce itself and other positive behavior can replace it. Uh, We really do need that baseline to tell us everything. Now, another question I get is, well, what kind of baseline should I take? And what does that behavior baseline look like? Um, And sure, you said, you know, collecting information. And I like that, you know, during a baseline, you may or may not know everything that's going on. So you want to know as much as possible. You know, first of all, frequency. How often is this behavior happening? Um, Sometimes, you know, by, you know, having an interview with the parent or the teacher or the therapist, you know, you can get a sense of, well, it's typically happening during this math program, or it usually happens during transitions, or I see it a lot during this. Great. Let's look at that data. So I'm going to take data on frequency, but maybe I'll break up frequency by time period. So during this time, 
time period to this time period, or this subject to this subject or transitions and break up the data that way. Um, and so that it can just be tick, tick, tick in those particular boxes is a really easy way to do it. Um, sometimes I want to get a sense of duration. So if, you know, a child is, or an individual is engaging in negative behavior like a tantrum that, yep, it's a tick on a box because it happened, but also how long did it happen for? You know, did the, you know, did the person tantrum for two minutes or did the person tantrum for 30 minutes at a time? Um, and I want to really get a sense of that. So, you know, I'll take duration data as well if it's a tantrum. If it's something like, um, I don't know, a an aggression, I say like a quick hit. There's no sense in taking duration data on that because it's a hit and it's gone. Um, so really look at that behavior. And once you define that, that should give you a sense of going, okay, I really do need frequency or duration or frequency and duration with that. Um, sure, we talked a little bit about ABC data in another a blog. And, you know, let's talk, chat a bit about that because ABC data is also an effective way to take baseline data. Yeah. So with ABC data, you're looking at the direct antecedent, what happened right before and the direct consequence, what happened right after. You will need to define the behavior very clearly first to see what you're collecting data on, but then specifically really just what happened right before and what after. And ABC data can be cumbersome. So we only recommend taking it for about three to five days. And it also gives you frequency information. So if you're filling out an ABC data sheet, you'll have information on the frequency, on the antecedents, potentially on time of day, if you could add that. And you can also add duration to that same sheet. So it does give you a lot of information on the whole picture of what's going on. And it's really important with baseline data, like Shira mentioned, three to five days tops, right? We want to really treat this problem behavior. So we want to make sure that our baseline is gives us enough information that we collect enough information, but we don't need reams and reams and reams of data. We don't need baseline to go on for one, two, three months if we can find out, you know, what we need to do. So if we know, okay, baseline is typically happens or, you know, it seems to be on average this frequency or on average this duration, that's what we need. Quick and quick and easy. And it's important to once you're stopping to collect baseline data. So once there's an intervention in place or that has begun to mark that on the graph, to have a change of condition line, as in baseline is now ending. Um, we usually use just like a dotted line down the graph. You can use a highlighter. You can any way that you can indicate on the graph that the, the Conditions are now changing. We're going from having no intervention in baseline to having an intervention post baseline. And that's where we want to see the change. So it's really important to mark that on the graph, whether on your frequency graph, on your duration graph, or both, that there's now a change in condition. And, you know, we're not talking about treatment here, but once treatment starts and you've put in place an intervention, you can always go back and take a look at your baseline data. Um, you know, for instance, you know, we took baseline data on duration of tantruming and, you know, duration was up near 30 minutes per tantrum. And, you know, we looked at frequency as well. And, you know, the student was having, you know, two to three tantrums per session, but each one was lasting about 30 minutes. Well, you know, as soon as we imp implemented the treatment, what we saw was that, you know, over a few days, the frequency actually increased. So there was more tantrums. And you look at that and go, oh, no, look, my base, like it, my frequencies increased from my baseline. Oh, no, my treatment isn't working. But then you look at duration and you say, oh, wow, look, duration has decreased decreased from 30 minutes to two minutes. Maybe there's a few more tantrums, but they're two minutes long instead of 30 minutes long. So that's why baseline will give you a really good picture of what's happening during treatment. So let's talk about baseline data for skill acquisition. So the process typically in putting skill acquisition programs in place is we always want to do an assessment, see, get a picture of where our client skills are at, and then from there, we go into teaching those skills or programming. But before we choose those programs or start implementing those programs, we want to get baseline on some of the skills that we're looking to increase. So we want to know exactly where is the child at on this specific skill. So for instance, if I were doing an assessment, say for instance, I was doing a VB map or an ABLES, 
and I was testing somebody on their colors. And, you know, I learned, okay, so they don't know their colors, or maybe they've got some receptive colors, but no expressive colors, what have you. That's a box on the ABLES or is a box on the VB map that I can go, okay, they don't have that. That indicates to me that I need to put that program in place. However, I'm going to stress very, very much so, like we always preach, do not te- do not teach to an assessment. We are not teaching the exact assessment. However, the assessment has flagged that this individual you know, doesn't have colors and should learn their colors. Um, So, you know, during baseline then, or I guess the best program then would be, okay, I go and I write a colors program to be able to teach them colors. Um, Then what I would do is take that colors program and I would baseline it. So what does that actually look like? I'm going to write out all the colors that I want them to know or to learn by the end of this program. I'm going to make up a number. Pretend there's 12 colors that they should learn by the end of this program, both receptive and expressive identification of these colors. I'm going to take all these colors and my baseline doesn't have to go on forever. My baseline can be a very simple point to purple. Great. Show me red. What color is this? What color is that? Awesome. That's it. That's baseline. You do it for your 12 items. That's it. That's all. You know, if the students got zero, don't put them through torture. You know, don't baseline it. Don't ask them 10 times for each color. That's way too many trials. And I've can almost guarantee you, you're going to have some problem behavior if you keep asking them over and over and over again. Um, what you want to do is you just want to do a really quick assessment, period. Now, if the student does, you know, pick red when you say, show me red, you can go awesome. And you might even go back to red again, just to make sure that wasn't a fluke. Um, but once you know, okay, they really do know red, that's amazing. You know, if they show you red the first time, but they, you know, it was a guess. And then the second time you go back to it and they didn't have it, you're like, okay, they they don't have this one. I need to teach that. So really the goal of baseline is just what do they know already versus what do they need to learn? Um, I think it's also really critical to say that during baseline, there's no reinforcement. So I can reinforce for things like great sitting and I love the way you're attending. Nice job. um, But I'm not going to reinforce for, wow, you picked red. That's amazing. Great job. That's blue. Uh, Because then that may skew the assessment. If I all of a sudden reinforce for, wow, that's blue. Then the next time around, they might go, oh, you know, I just got reinforcement for that. I'm going to pick blue again. So baselines are just really, really, really quick. I can typically do baseline if a student is already sitting and has those attending behaviors. I can typically do a baseline in, you know, three minutes tops. Um, It's pretty, pretty quick. Um, and then the other question would be like, what's the difference between baseline and pretest? So, like I said, you you know you've done your assessment, you've identified that the student you know needs to, needs to learn colors. You do your baseline assessment. Baseline identifies that they you know have learned their primary colors. Um, test me on my primary colors again: um, red, <laughs> blue, and yellow. You know they've got those ones, but they don't have any of the other ones for some reason. So they're able to you know identify red, blue, and yellow, but that's it. And that's what your baseline has shown. Okay, great. Now I'm going to do a pretest. What does that mean? A pretest means I'm going to pick the, the three next colors to teach or the two next colors to teach or whatever I'm teaching next. And I'm just going to do a really quick pretest on those colors. So I've already done baseline. So I pretty much know. So it's really just going to be, okay, show me green, what color, show me yellow, what color, show me whatever the other color I'm going to ask them for. Um, what color is that? That's it. That's it. That's my pretest. So again, very quick and simple. And then you would teach and then you would go on to the next condition. There's no more baseline. You're already into your colors program. There's no more baseline. But after you teach that next condition, then you would do another pretest for those next two or three colors that you're teaching and on and on and on. So you do one baseline at the beginning of the program. You do pretests on each teaching step throughout the program as you introduce them. And then at the very end, you would go back and do what I would call like a post test. It looks similar to a baseline, but just to show, yep, you know what? Like three months ago, this kid did not have colors. Look at now, three months later, the student understands all his colors. So when you're doing that baseline, you know, let's say there's 12 colors and, you know, your client got three of them right. So they scored about 25% on the baseline data. You mark that on the graph. So you mark 25%. You could do the change of condition line after that. And then you always have what to reference. What's your goal? Your goal mastery criteria could be that he has to score 80% or 90% or whatever that is. 
Um, and then you can compare. So you always have what to reference to in terms of, are they learning? And is this progressing? Because you have that baseline, that 25% to compare it to as you do your post-test um, at the end of the targets. It also you know, helps you understand, you know, let's say the assessment, they didn't score so well on colors and you do your baseline and they got like nine out of 12, correct. You know, that you're starting at a very different place in that program when they scored 75% on a baseline versus when they scored 25% on a baseline. So you maybe want to reevaluate whether they need this program at all. If they, if they're, they baselines at 75%, maybe you have a minimum of 80% for a baseline to, to put the, to not put that program in place. And so it helps make the teaching more intentional and relevant. You're not teaching things that they already know, and you're deciding to put the programs in place that are really needed because time is important for our kids. And we want to choose the programs that really matter. So choosing the things that they really need, we need to know that from the baseline data. Such a good point, Shira. I mean, with baseline data, you know, if you didn't take baseline data, you may start the colors program right from the beginning and you might do three weeks before you're actually teaching the student something that they don't know already. Whereas if you can do a quick baseline that takes three minutes, you can go, oh, I can actually start at step seven and not at step one. And that way you haven't wasted anyone's time and the student is learning right from the get-go. Yeah, so we did create a free baseline reference guide. So you can click this link in around the video to check that out. And just a summary of how to use baseline data. Um, you know, we talked all about baseline data today, and we gave you the best ways to take baseline data, both with skill acquisition and behavior reduction, and how to use it effectively to make database decisions. So again, click the link on around this video and get your free baseline reference guide.